We describe igneous rocks and characterize them and classify them based on their texture and their composition. So the texture is the size, the shape, and arrangement of the minerals within the rock in the first place. And the composition are what minerals comprise and make up that igneous rock. So on the screen here, we have four main types of igneous rocks. And as you can see, the igneous rock right here looks like it has very large minerals and different kinds of minerals. On the top right hand, you can see it looks, igneous rocks look, looks like it's comprised of maybe one or two minerals and contains all these little holes and vesicles. On the bottom left hand of the screen, you can see this dark black igneous rock that looks very glassy and smooth and looks like it's comprised of one mineral. And on the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you can see this igneous rock that looks pretty smooth, but also rough in texture and really unsure how many minerals it could be comprised of just based on what the rock looks like in hand sample. All these igneous rocks are different types of igneous rocks. So we have a granite here, we have a pumice here, we have an obsidian here, and then we have basalt. And I'll talk a little bit about what some of these textures and compositions are. We have about five main different types of textures that we'll go over in this course. Remember the texture is the description of the size, the shape, and the arrangement of the minerals that comprise that igneous rock. And so we know that these minerals, once that igneous rock cools and solidifies from a melt, all of those mineral grains will grow and interlock with one another. The first type of texture that we have to describe igneous rocks are aphanitic, essentially fine grain. These are minerals that you cannot see with the naked eye. You essentially need some kind of microscope to look at a thin section of that rock. So here we have a thin section of an igneous rock, and this is an aphanitic texture. So you can see that these are all really small, but really well interlocked grains. If you see an igneous rock that has an aphanitic texture, fine grains, you can't really make out the different types of minerals that exist within that rock without the aid of some kind of equipment like a microscope, you can infer that the rock went under rapid cooling, which means that that melt cooled very quickly. Therefore, the crystals did not have time to grow. We essentially can equate aphanitic igneous rocks to being extrusive forming, which means that they have formed on the surface of the earth from the quick cooling of some kind of lava. The next one we have is phaneritic, which is the opposite of aphanitic. Phaneritic are coarse grained rocks. You can see on the image here that these are much larger crystals. Now both these images are showing minerals at this, are, are showing thin sections at the same scale underneath the microscope. So we have different types of minerals, but they're much larger and they're still interlocking. Phaneritic or coarse grain textures indicate a slower cooling in comparison to the aphanitic, which means in hand sample, you can make out each one of these minerals with your naked eye. The crystals, uh, because they are much larger, it means that they had a longer time to grow. This can infer that this igneous rock was likely formed in an intrusive environment, which means that these are minerals that had cooled from some kind of magma melt at depth. So here are two examples of aphanitic and phaneritic rocks. So on the left hand side of the screen here, we can see a rock that has many different colors, but we can't really make out what kind of minerals they are. They're very small. On the right hand side of the screen, we have an example of what a phaneritic rock would look like, where you can make out each one of the individual minerals with the naked eye. We have three more types of textures. The first one is porphyritic texture, which means that it contains both large and small crystals. So both coarse and fine grain minerals, or both phaneritic and aphanitic minerals. Because it contains both 
large and smaller crystals, this can indicate two stages of cooling, which means that magma body initially began to cool at depth. And so some of these crystals begin to grow and grow and grow. And then all of a sudden that magmatic body with those now cooled crystals then got extruded towards Earth's surface and thus the remaining of that melt cooled really quickly. So we call those larger crystals in the finer grain ground mass, we call those larger crystals phenocrysts. So on the screen here, you can see these phenocrysts and then these smaller minerals, we call those the ground mass minerals. The next type of texture is a glassy texture. So a good example of a rock that exhibits a glassy texture would be obsidian, which you probably have all heard of before. The next type of texture we have is glassy texture. Now, this is when you have a very rapid cooling of some kind of melt in an extrusive setting where no crystallization has occurred, which means that there is a random ordering and arrangement of those atoms, just like crystal glass. The next one and the last one is fragmental texture or pyroclastic texture. So what will happen is these generally occur um, in areas where you have volcanoes. And so as that magma, that melt, breaches its way through that volcanic neck, essentially the opening onto Earth's surface, that melt will grab off some of the areas of the hard rock that make up the volcano in the first place. And they will then push a lot of these now fragmented rock up into the air. As both the fragments and thus now the remaining portions of that melt settle down on Earth's surface, they can slowly begin to cement together. So a lot of the times these minerals that are in this ground mass can exhibit some kind of these shattering textures. Um, and you need to be able to see this ground mass. Um, you need to be, in order to be able to see the ground mass, you need a microscope um, or other kind of equipment in order to make out what kind of minerals are within that ground mass. We also identify igneous rocks based on their composition. So remember we talked about the four main compositions, which are ultramafic, mafic, intermediate, and felsic. Now the difference between felsic and mafic rocks is essentially the amount of silica. So mafic rocks are gonna to tend to contain more mafic minerals like olivine and pyroxene. Now the felsic rocks will contain more felsic minerals like quartz, potassium, feldspar, and muscovite. So magma composition can range from ultramafic to felsic, like I just said, where felsic contains a higher amount of silica than the ultramafic rocks. Ultramafic rocks contain mostly olivine and pyroxene. And two types of ultramafic rocks, common types of ultramafic rocks, are comatite and peridotite. Now, as you can see on the screen here, comatite looks a lot more fine grained than peridotite. So, comatite is essentially an aphanitic counterpart of peridotite, where we both, or in this case, in both cases, you had an ultramafic magma chamber, an ultramafic melt that either cooled deep down inside of the earth or it cooled on earth's surface. So deep down inside the earth, you can make out the individual crystals and minerals. Whereas the same counterpart, the same exact type of magma and melt could have cooled on earth's surface where you can't make out the individual minerals and crystals. Then we have our mafic rocks. Mafic rocks tend to contain a lot of olivine and pyroxene, but they also tend to contain that calcium rich plagioclase feldspar alongside of maybe a little bit of amphibole. The two types of mafic, common mafic rocks that we have 
are basalt and gabbro, where basalt is a mafic igneous rock that cools on Earth's surface, so an extrusive igneous rock, whereas gabbro is an intrusive igneous rock of the same kind of mafic composition. Then we have intermediate igneous rocks, where they also contain a lot of plagioclase feldspar, but more teetering on the edges of the sodium-rich plagioclase feldspar. And they contain an abundance of amphibole um, biotite. And now we're beginning to get inklings of some of these felsic minerals like quartz. A good example of some intermediate igneous rocks that we have are andesite and diorite, where andesite is the aphanitic counterpart of diorite. So andesite forms and cools on, on Earth's surface, and diorite cools at depth. And then lastly, that brings us to the felsic igneous rocks where they contain mostly of the sodium-rich plagioclase feldspar, along with amphibole biotite. And then they contain uh, an abundance of these felsic minerals like quartz and potassium feldspar. Some examples of these and are common ones that you've likely heard before, which are granite, which is commonly used for countertops and other kind of building materials. Now granite forms at depth, so it is an intrusive igneous rock. And its extrusive counterpart, its aphanitic counterpart, is rhyolite. It is important to note that ultramafic, mafic, intermediate, and felsic rocks, you can see their percentage of mineral composition here. These are all ranges. So you can, for example, you can definitely get granitic rocks that contain a lot more quartz and potassium feldspar than what is shown here. So these are just ranges. Another example would be for the ultramafic rocks. So ultramafics, like you see pritatite and comatite here, contain about 80% olivine with 20% pyroxene. There are some ultramafic rocks, for example, that contain 100% olivine. Dunite is a really good example, which is um, an aphanitic olivine rock.